Go ahead and get started this morning. I had a couple comments that I was thinking about. The, um, I was reading in the news this morning that uh, Julian Assange, you know, WikiLeaks, you know, he's been, he was in exile in, uh, in Ecuador. He had to barricade himself in the uh, embassy in, in Ecuador, in any Ecuadorian embassy. I think he's still there, and he's in, in uh, London. And uh, the United States is uh, trying to extradite him and uh, put him on trial here. And, you know, his wife says that if he comes to the United States, he'll never, they'll, they'll put him to death. They'll execute him. And uh, I think about him, Edward Snowden, you know, the Edward Snowden, guy that went to ha Russia. Um, what was, what's the big crime of these guys? See, in both cases, they're, they were exposing the deep state's war on the American people. And see, and that, they wanted to keep that information hidden. And so, you know, the article I was reading, it was published in, in, in England, was pointing out that this is a very important trial because the entire issue of uh, journalistic freedom is on the line for the free world, which I thought was an interesting commentary, and that, that's really true. So just uh, the forces of darkness, what I was really thinking about was, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6 again, just a review comment. Ephesians 6, um, verses 10 through 13. Ephesians 6, 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Uh, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggles not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. You know, it's the thing that I was thinking about is how massive the uh, forces of darkness are and how they work in every single area. You know, obviously, Satan has to work through free, man's free will too. But there are definitely influences and things like that that, that impact our warfare. And in Revelation chapter 9, in verse 1, some of the, <coughs> the trumpet sounds here. Revelation 9.1, it says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came the locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them, as scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months, and the torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. In those days, Beth, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees it from them. The appearance of the locusts like horses prepared for battle. On their heads there appeared to be crowns like gold, their faces like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and sound their wings like, like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is the power to hurt men for five months. <clears throat> they have a king over them, the angel of the abyss. The name is in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So, you know, I'll let you know who the, the angel of that abyss was. You know, the abyss basically is Revelation's word for Tartarus of Second Peter 2.4. But you get here a picture of these massive forces uh, under the, the realm of darkness. And uh, the king, see, it's interesting, then it's pretty clear that Satan then is the uh, former, I guess we might call him archangel, that's in, in charge of all these guys, and they operate under his direction. So those are the forces of darkness that are arrayed. We see those things operating on earth. And so it's going to take the tremendous power of the new creation, you know, the direct application, those principles, 
continued application of those principles in our lives in order for us to be the victors that God intends us to be. So I just thought that was interesting and, and again, should spur us on to greater commitment if that's what we need to do because you've got to prepare for the battle. Okay, the sixth thing, next thing I want to do is uh, I want to have an interview with uh, Matthew Wilson. Now, uh, he interviews me on Ask JW. And uh, so why don't you hand him the microphone, Miss Alina, and come on up here, Matthew. And, uh, okay, <clears throat> I think this is instructive, okay? Now, he, does, he has no idea what questions I'm going to ask him any more than I have any idea what question he's going to ask me uh, when I ask, does a, J, a, ask JW, okay? Keeps That's, it fun. Keeps it fun, yeah. So you, just, you and Alina just recently finished up a Bible study with a young couple. Yeah, and uh, so basically, what was their religious belief system coming into the study? Oh, they believed that they were Christian. Okay, and they saved by what process? Saved by grace, and, uh, you know, I asked them at the beginning of the study, you know, how, you know, if someone were to walk in right, right now and ask you how to be saved, well, believe that Jesus died for your sins, and... Uh, Repent and b believe that he's the Savior, and and you'll be saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you guys began the study, uh, you know, kind of a friendly basis. You worked a little bit of proof that the Bible's the Word of God in. Yep. And then you got into plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. So where did the breakdown start to come when you when you did this? <laughs> well, we're going through the PowerPoints, and you know it's pretty systematic. In the logic, you know, believe, okay, you know, were these guys under, or, you know, was this guy under the new covenant? Yes. Are we under the same covenant? Yes. Can anyone be saved without believing? No. Okay, same question goes along for every, uh, you know, repent, confess. Yes, 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 yes. We get to immersion, Acts twenty two sixteen. Can anyone be saved without being immersed? Well, that's a stretch. So... It's like, well, you know, how's that a stretch? You know, we're being consistent all the way through here. So, but that's the exact moment that they just, you know, went opposite direction from what we were saying. So once you hit that point, basically they tried to find every point they could, could to argue with you, right, from that point on? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a brawl for <laughs> a couple weeks Studies went longer than, than usual, and it was, it was a lot of back-and-forth debate. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I think you showed me a stack of papers this <laughs> thick that they brought to the last study. What would you say the contents of those, uh, those papers were? It was basically explaining every verse that I had brought up on immersion into Christ. It, didn't act it appears that it means this on first glance, but upon further examination, it doesn't actually mean that. Yeah, I, I know I took a quick glance, and, uh, of course, I hit the section where it was looking, talking about Acts 2.38. Yeah. And uh, it said in there that Acts 2.38 is uh, it's not a theological scripture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, it doesn't mean anything, I get it. Yeah. Did you, do you feel like you were prepared <clears throat> going into this study? Absolutely, yeah. I, th I think that um, I had full confidence because, you know, I had been through some studies like this before. And even had some questions that, you know, I didn't know how to answer before. But, but you know, when you, when you have great teachers and great uh, training, training grounds that can help you prepare, you, you realize that there's just no holes in the scripture. It, this, this case is airtight, and really it's not up to, you know, it doesn't all depend upon me. It's the scripture that does the talking, and you can have full confidence in that. Yeah. So... You know, basically, you would say anybody in this crowd is pretty well prepared more than they might even think they are to handle I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're not, there's only one way to get prepared, and that's the game is the best teacher. So. Yeah. And uh, so sometimes when you hit a question you couldn't answer, does that drive the answer in your head pretty oh, strong? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple questions, again, from this study you know, that I hadn't, hadn't heard before, but I know how to answer them next time. Yeah, good. Has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask Matthew here this morning? <laughs> <laughs> All 
right. Well, well thanks. <laughs> good, right. good job. I yeah, appreciate that. No. But see, again, that's, that's, that's down there in the trenches. And the, one of the key points is, is you lose more than you win. That's just, that's just the nature of it. Doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Uh, and, you know, you don't have to do everything perfectly right. You know, the scripture still does, does an amazing amount of talking. And so that's, you know, we, we could all take our shots and see what happens. But uh, you're going to lose more than you're going to win. And that's because man is pretty stubborn. You know, they're basically they want to do what they want to do. And they don't want God or anybody else telling them they can't. So they, you've got a lot of resistance. Uh, and you just have to learn how to power through that with a positive attitude. See, it can be pretty, pretty discouraging. You know, you try 15, 20 times, you got no results. Um, but see, that's, a, that's the world we live in. You know, the days when Walter Scott could go into a Ohio Village and the whole town would come out to the town meeting place and, you know, preach to a crowd of 300 people and immerse 30 people that night, those, those days are gone. That's not the, uh, not the wheat fields that we, that we work in. Our wheat fields are kind of a blade at a time, okay? And uh, that's a lot of work for comparatively little result. But is it worth it? See, how much is one soul worth? You know, if we help change one person's eternity, that's more than all the gold that ever was in Fort Knox by far. And so the value of what we're doing is, is tremendous. You, you always want to remember that. Anything you can do to encourage somebody to take another step into the scripture or another step toward uh, truth, uh, that's, that's always positive. And you never know where, where, where that's going to lead. You know, some people get a hold of it and they follow through. And, and some people, they hit a point where, okay, I've come this far, but I'm not going any further. And that's, that's where this couple hit. They probably started running the calculation. If Acts 2.38 means what it says, number one, I'm not saved and I'm not sure I can handle that. Number two, that means a lot of people that I think are saved aren't saved, and I know I can't handle that. I mean, that's their mentality going in. So those are, those are things that we run into. So pretty good. Then I had another question that uh, kind of ties in. Um, let's go back to Exodus 33 here. Exodus 33, in uh, verse 17, it's where God's talking to Moses and uh, basically asks Moses, you know, to ask for anything. In verse 17, Exodus 33, 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, and you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and will show compassion on whom I show compassion. But he says, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Okay. And so the next chapter there in verse 6, well, I'll do first start in verse 5. I always thought this is interesting here. <clears throat> the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. So the Lord's going to pass by, and the Lord's standing beside him. Okay? It's not very Trinitarian. <laughs> okay? Uh, but uh, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will no, by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the grandchildren, the third and fourth generations. So notice that when God is describing himself, he's describing his qualities. I am compassionate, gracious, slow to anger. So, you know, the question is, is okay, it has to do with, you know, identity. Of course, and identity is a big buzzword, you know, gender identity. See, the, the goal of the Marxist is to totally mess up the language. See, if they mess it up the language, they can run an agenda through. Um, you know, I sent out the email, bulletin by e email, and I had got to thinking about, you know, one man, one vote. When the United States was set up, they set it up as a republic. 
and there was quite a discussion uh, in the in the con on the Continental Congress or the uh, Constitutional Convention, as it became, as to how the states are going to be represented in the legislature. And so what was get called the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise, pretty much authored by Roger Sherman, was that the state's representation would be based on population, and then that each state would have two, two senators. So in other words, the, the small states like Delaware and uh, you know, small population states were very concerned that states like New York and Pennsylvania would run over the top of them. So they bid it, set it up you know, that way to have what they call checks and balances in there. So most of the state legislatures ended up being set up after the same model. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, when I was in high school, there was they, something they had called one man, one vote. And the idea was being pushed that we were a democracy uh, rather than a republic. The, uh, one of the classes, requ required class by the state of Montana uh, for seniors in the high school, public high school was called Problems of Democracy. And the biggest problem of democracy is that the United States is not supposed to be one. <laughs> okay, but that never got discussed, okay. Uh, democracies always head toward tyranny, the abolition of freedom. Uh, basically what a democracy is, a system by which the demagogues persuade the multitudes to vote away their freedom. It's, and, uh, so the founding fathers knew that. So they set up a republic. And they, so the states, the fact is the Constitution guarantees to each state a Republican form of government. So not a Democratic form, a Republican, because they understood the difference. So the Supreme Court in 1964 said, you know, the uh, way the state legislatures are currently set up is undemocratic. Uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren says uh, they are to represent voters, not acres and trees. So they forced the state legislatures then to be apportioned both houses on the basis of population. And Senator Everett Dirksen at the time, senator from Illinois, he warned, he said, what's going to happen places like Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, they're going to dominate. You know, the, the six million residents of Chicago area, as it was at the time, are going to ignore the four million other voters in the rest of the state. And, of course, that's proven to be true. So now, you know, you got states like Oregon, where Portland totally dominates, Portland and South Eugene, uh, totally dominate Oregon, and the rest of the state has got no representation, really. See, that, and that's because, see, one of the major checks and balances was removed by the deliberate action of the Supreme Court. And uh, so you see the destruction, see, I mean, there's a pretty good chunk of Oregon that wants to succeed from Oregon and become part of Idaho, okay? Because um, they got no representation, see? And, then, and that was a deliberate, the, the, the vote was eight to one, and the dissenting justice said that the, the court just took it upon itself to amend the Constitution. See, and he gave the reasons why. He was, he was right on. So, okay, now that leads into where we're at today with this gender identity stuff, Right? Um, you know, people all over the country are, are getting in trouble, losing their jobs, uh, censured, uh, because they're saying that there's only two, two genders, male and female. A very controversial statement, you understand. See, that's that, this part of that movement, see, that keeps moving, 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 a deliberate agenda. I got censored uh, a week and a half ago. I was speaking in Helena, and I brought in the idea that... Uh, the, you know, there's, they use aborted babies uh, to make vaccines. Well, they threw the whole program off, because it's broadcast on Facebook, they threw the whole program off Facebook because of that one statement. You know, and, you know, Michelle uh, Borelli in Great Falls, who was doing it, you know, she, she presented the evidence and everything else didn't matter. How could we get to the point where, you know, basically uh, three sentences in a presentation could be picked up. <coughs> artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence can, can mine and monitor stuff. See, that's, those things are significant here. So 
you got this identity, push gender identity, totally destroying the identity of the idea of what identity is about. See? <clears throat> you know, go back to Exodus 3. Where God first gives his name. See, there's there's a lot there's references, quite a few references to Yahweh in Genesis, but that's Moses going back and, and putting you know his perspective from Exodus on into the book of Genesis. You know, there's numerous instances of that. But in uh, Exodus 3.13, Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said to, Thus you shall say to Israel, The sons of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. Notice that God goes right back to identity. I am who I am. Okay? Now, he is compassionate and gracious, you know, slow to anger. Will by, by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Those are all characteristics of who he is, see, and described in those terms. Now, the, when you're meeting somebody for the first time, generally after a little while, the conversation rolls around, and, okay, what, uh, what do you do? I mean, what's your profession? You know, what's, your, what's your trade? You know, what, what's your function? So, see, and that's, of course, that's part of our way trying to bridge communication gaps. You know, you got to, you know, all of us a little skeptical about the next guy, you know, and rightly so. It does, like Joe was talking a little bit this morning, you know what I mean? There's certain things about experience will teach you that, uh, okay, not, not everybody is as level-headed as they should be, right? I mean, you got some interesting people out there, I guess is the way we'd put it. Yeah, it got to be. So, you know, usually start with something kind of non-threatening, you know, what, uh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a spy for the CIA. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, but you know it's it's but see, a person isn't necessarily what he does. What he does is a reflection of who he is. Okay, and if a person's identity is only tied to what they do, very shallow, very shallow identity. And people get into trouble because of the fact their identity is tied to what they do. Um, okay, you know I'm. You know, I'm a, I'm a worker at Dairy Queen, and that's, that's my family. Well, that's a pretty shaky, <laughs> pretty shaky family. I, anybody who's ever worked at Dairy Queen, you know, I used to work at McDonald's. I worked at McDonald's for a couple years. That would be a very shaky family to have and a very, very, very bad place to build your identity on. But a lot of people do that. You know, a lot of the guys I used to work with, the smelter, that was their identity. You know, they... Um, you know, their families came in the 1890s to, from Eastern Europe and Italy to, to work in the jobs in the smelter. And so they're there. Uh, of course, this is, you know, 1969, 1970, which hard to believe that's been more than 50 years ago. But see, these guys, that was, that's their identity. And that was their life, you know. And uh, the uh, hard for them to break out of that. So a lot of those ty guys, when they retired, two years later, they're dead because their identity was gone. So it's worth considering uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Yeah, I think Joe really hit on this this morning about who we are. And our, I think he was making a great point that our performance is tied to our picture of who we are. So you can show people how to do things, but if the... If there's no change in the picture, they're not going to be able to do what you show them how. See, like, you know, appreciate Matthew getting up here and being the guinea pig this morning. And, you know, he, like I say, he didn't know what's coming. He handled it well. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's obviously got confidence now going into Bible studies. He knows that he's the kind of person who can handle anything that they're going to throw at him. Well, that's, 
that's very helpful. When you have the confidence, then that tends to give you the courage to, to make the next shot, to, to try to set up, you know, meet the next person, try to set up the next Bible study. So God always really works with who we are in, uh, in our identity, in other words. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.17, <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, create, new creature, a new creation. The old things passed away, new things have come. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. That has to be the picture <clears throat> in our heads. Okay? And there's a lot of characteristics of a new creation, you know, uh, kind, slow to anger, compassionate, patient, um, but truthful. See, all those things go together in who we are. So um, the devil is going to attack that distinction here because <clears throat> he's going to drive the idea that you are defined uh, by your external circumstances. That, that's what you see over and over again is your, your external. How many people have been confused <clears throat> about the gender identity <clears throat> because they bought into the idea that the world's circumstances are dictating who they are? When you, <clears throat> um, when I think about the medical advances necessary <clears throat> to have uh, gender-affirming surgery, see, I mean, I can't, I can't even process how, now I know there's money there, I suspect, you know, a lot of money from the federal government is uh, be my suspicion if a person could dig into it. You got to remember, <coughs> Congress doesn't even can't even figure out how many agencies there are, <coughs> much less where the money's going. Okay, <laughs> can't even figure out how many agencies there are. Uh, so, you know, I suspect there's a lot of money coming from the federal government that's driving all the the gender surgery, gender affirming surgery as they call it. See, so always put the positive spin on it. Um, <coughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Okay, let's, let's talk about inclusivity for a minute here. <coughs> what does inclusivity do to a person's image or their identity of themselves? It's like, you guys got to accept me as I am. You know, there's a big billboard on the way to Great Falls that says, if you ever felt different for any reason, call us. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty open-ended, you know. Um, <clears throat> you know, the colors would indicate, you know, the, on the sign what sort of feeling different is. You know, there's a Methodist church on the west side of Great Falls. That's, they got their sign up. It says, all are welcome here. I suspect I wouldn't be, but uh, <laughs> see why? <clears throat> because diversion, diversity, you know, equity and inclusion is designed to make it possible not to call sinners out of darkness. Inclusivity means, okay, we're all going to be in darkness together. And anybody that's trying to, to change that, see, is an enemy of democracy. So we have, to, we have to process here the landscape that we operate in, a lot of landmines, a lot of barbed wire, a lot of trenches, a lot of walls, uh, <coughs> barriers to, to evangelism. And that's the devil's orchestration here. So what we're doing is we're trying to find people that are interested enough in truth to, to go through those barriers and learn the process here that God is changing who we are. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What about the old stuff passed away? I want to read from a website. We are a group of broken people showing others that despite all our shortcomings, Jesus still loves us and wants us to know, know, love, and trust in him. We need to get together to worship Jesus, learning from his holy scriptures, and grow closer to one another, all to the glorification of God. So if they're all broken, how are they going to help somebody be, be whole? Now the name of this website is Belgrade Church of Christ. See, what are they doing? <laughs> See, they're playing to the, you know, an aspect of the diversity, equity, inclusivity. You know, we're all broken. Okay? And so <clears throat> we're all just beggars showing other people how to maybe find some bread. You know I mean? That's, 
that sells well because it says, okay, if your identity is a loser, okay, you're, you're gonna, it's okay to stay a loser. Can you just, just stay a loser? Uh, just stay down and wallow. And uh, all kinds of other people can wallow with you, and you'll feel better about the fact that there's other people wallowing together. And, uh, but the fact is everybody's still muddy, okay, <laughs> is, is the point. So this is part of that core battle that we fight. Now, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, just want to m- m- mention here again that <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, and then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And that lets you know, of course, that the image of God is not physical. It's a, it's a spiritual image. And what the devil has been attacking from the beginning is that image. See, God's, the devil's trying to take people that are in the image of God and drag them down to his level. So they ended up being in the image of Satan. You say, well, that's a little extreme. Well, let's go to John chapter 8 here. <clears throat> John chapter 8, and verse 44. Jesus said <clears throat> to the Jewish hierarchy, he said, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, what happens is that which should be in the image of God ends up being in the image of Satan. So this is the core battle is over who you are. That's the core battle. The whole idea of evolution is that you are the last accident on a long chain of accidents. So how important are you? You know, the earth is just a pale blue dot in uh, the vastness of the solar system, much less the galaxy, much less the universe. If it's just a pale blue dot, how important is that? That's Carl Sagan, by the way, Uh, late Carl Sagan. Uh, He probably found out that was not a good statement to make. See, but that's, that's where the forces of the world, the force of darkness are going. They're attacking the picture of who we are. And God's getting us over to the idea, that yes, we can. You know, I mean, f- turn to Philippians chapter 4. I know you guys have never seen this, so I'm going to point it out to you. <clears throat> Philippians 4.13 Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, Paul isn't talking about running faster than a speeding bullet, stopping runaway freight trains, or leaping over skyscrapers. But he is talking about the fact that any situation we face, we can be the winners. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We're not doing it on our own. We recognize that. We're going to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. You know, who formed us in the first place in our mother's womb? God did. But who reformed us in the watery womb of immersion? He reformed us in his image, in the image of Christ. So if you didn't get it the first time, you really get it the second time because you're going to be able to process uh, uh, you know, what, which, what went wrong the first time. So what a powerful statement this is. I can do all things. So that's the attitude and perspective that we face our life's challenges is I can. I am the kind of person who can do all these things. I can face the challenges. I can come out a winner by God's strength. In the second, second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, Second Timothy 4, 6, Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Kind of a great picture there, you know, when they take the, uh, the wine 
certain offerings they poured out on the, uh, as a libation on the altar, just vaporized, right? Great, great picture. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. In other words, he's going to die. <clears throat> I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. See, in the future is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. <clears throat> Paul, confident? Did he fight the battles? Yes, he did. Did he win? Hey, Paul, you're in prison. You know, you're apparently in the Mamertine prison, which is a place that they held people for execution. Uh, you're in the Mamertine. How are you saying you're a winner? How, how are you saying that you overcame? Well, spiritually, he is, isn't he? He's going out. He's going out the victor. And uh, see, it's a great example for us in the scriptures. So those are the types of things that we want to keep in mind. But so wherever we're at, see, we want to keep working on this picture of who I am and allow the scriptures to tell us who we are. Katie and I have commented numerous times that um, when people try to get their value from other people or their job or the house they live in or whatever it is. When people try to get their value from anything external, it's always going to get truncated. See? And so what God's working on is for us to get our value from him. And he repeatedly tells us how valuable we are. Uh, let's go to the book of Jude. Jude 1.1. 1, 1. Jude, he says, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, kept for Jesus Christ. Yeah, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Beloved? You know, you know in one of my studies that I have, uh, both the guys in that study, you know, they're pretty honest with me, which I really appreciate. You know, when, when people are being honest, then we can then we can help. And, uh, you know, both of them at different times said that the, they didn't think God could love them. They were being honest. They said, you know, I've, I've been down so many bad roads and I've done so many things. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I, I can understand how God can love other people, but I don't know that he can love me. Well, if you don't think God loves you, where are you? See, what's your picture of yourself? Unloved, you know, orphan, waif, stumbling in the darkness, right? Well, what kind of a life is that? See? So Scripture is really trying to help us process who we are and get our value from him rather than our value from what we do or who we interact with. For a little bit, there was a, Cliff will remember, there was a, Guy, he moved here from Colorado. He was the uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce. Remember him, Cliff? And uh, Cliff's nodding his head. And uh, so I actually went over to visit him, and it was kind of interesting because his knowledge of Scripture was, you know, I mean, he was from a Christian church, I think, in Broomfield in the Denver area. And uh, Scripture, you know, knowledge was really small. And I was going to try to help him you know, get some scripture information, but he was a lot more concerned about, okay, this is my house here, this is the neighborhood, you know, the judge lives down here, the superintendent of the schools lives here, and uh, these are the people. So when he was here, he was looking to see if we had people of substance in the congregation. Well, you guys look pretty average, okay, as far as from the human side, right? But that's not the important thing. The important thing is how God sees us, right? But you see, he's look, he's trying, my point is he's trying to get his value from the wrong place. And if you're trying to get your value from the wrong place, that is, is, that is at some point, that's a major recipe for disaster. So that's why, you know, once again, I was talking to these guys, and I mentioned this, but I want to mention it again. 
one of the guys was really struggling. And I said, did you happen to see the Passion of the Christ? And he said, uh, yeah, actually, he said, I watched that a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was very interesting. And I said, well, you want to process the fact that if you'd have been the only one, Jesus did that for you. I said, that brutal death was necessary in order to communicate to us how valuable we are. If Jesus just died in his sleep and that was for our... See, I would, it's not going to communicate. You know, but if you look at Philippians chapter 2... Philippians chapter 2, in verse 8, says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient and pointed death. Oh, even death on a cross. He's emphasizing that brutal, brutal death because that's how God's communicating to us how valuable we are. So we've got to get our value, we've got to get our identity from the Scripture. And he keeps telling us over and over and over again, this is who you are. Does he use the term saint or does he use the term sinner? <clears throat> you know, does the scripture say we're all broken sinners? Does the scripture say we're all victorious saints? You know, again, Joe did a great job, you know, when he was talking about the overwhelming uh, conquerors there out of Romans chapter 8. He said, that doesn't sound like a you know, group of losers. That sounds like a a mar you know, army marching in triumph. See, that's a, that's a great picture, and that was a great opening. So God does a lot of work to let us know, yes, you are loved, you are valuable, you count, and uh, this is what you can do. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. No matter what challenge you face in life, no matter what difficulties you come up against, you can be on the winning side of that. That's, that's just tremendously important. And it's not just words. It's backed by the power of God. It is words, but it's not just words. See, when God says, immersion in Jesus' name is for forgiveness of sins, yes, those are words. What if God doesn't back those words? But he does. God says you're a new creation in Christ. Those are words, but does God back those words? Yes, I, our, our identity, who we are, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. That's a, I'm really glad that Joe brought that up this morning because that's, that's the key. And so the core of performance then is to think in terms of how God sees us. See, who's got the best analysis, us or God? Well... Um, I guess that'd be God, right? Okay, so God says, this is who we are, so we're going to say something different. Saints, you know, holy ones, beloved, you know, faithful, called, chosen. See, all those words are there to help us process the identity. And that's the key to victory. So I, I did want to, I did appreciate the question and wanted to comment on that. Anybody else got something they want to throw in on that? Yeah, Chris. Just wanted to comment on identity. That I know, like in the recent Bible study, you're talking about like math, and um, I know like man can make modifications to like uh, computer algorithms and things like that. But um, as far as like the identity, I don't, I don't think you can make modifications to your chromosomes. Um, and I also wanted to touch on that. Uh, uh, that God's word uh, doesn't change, but you know, man does tr try to you know change things uh, artificially. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, that, you remember, artificial intelligence is still artificial. <laughs> okay, and uh, you know, it's pretty blind in some areas. Uh, and that's a great point too, Chris. Let's go to First Peter chapter one. You mentioned, you know, DNA and chromosomes and stuff like that. First uh, Peter chapter 1 and uh, verse 22 and 23 says, uh, Since you, First Peter 1, 22, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, 
fervently love one another from the heart. If you've been born again, not of the seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. Notice that there's a spiritual DNA that has been put into us. See, we are new creations, and God put new spiritual chromosomes into us. And you think about it, you know, in the physical realm, okay, going back to identity, you know, the, you know there's one pair of chromosomes that's um, an X and a Y, right, if in males. It's an X and an X in females. It doesn't matter how much surgery you do, guess what? Those chromosomes don't change. They're your, your identity, okay? But God put a spiritual DNA into us to cause us to be born again as new creations. See, and this is tremendously powerful, recognize. So that's why Christians are called what? Sons of God. See, it's the spiritual DNA is in there. The information in the chromosomes is incredible. I mean, the amount of information that's packed into the chromosomes, enough information there to make you and start you from one cell and to maintain you. See, which is which is just incredible if you try to process that. <clears throat> but it's, it's important and, and it's complex and tremendous amount of knowledge that goes into the physical DNA. If you think about it, how much goes into the spiritual DNA? See, the spiritual DNA in here causes you to be born again. Not just born. Born again. See. Don't forget... The power, the word of God is living and active. You know, it's powerful for the destruction of uh, anything raised up against the knowledge of God. And so we get to wield the sword uh, in triumph.